Hey everybody, welcome back! This is Earth and Space Science 102, and this is the third lecture of our meteorology um, weather and climate segment. So the uh, first couple of lectures we talked about, we dealt with air pressure and the global circulation of the Earth's atmosphere. And now we're going to zero that in a little bit to talk about um, weather and even kind of going beyond that, we'll talk about climate in the latitudes of 30 to 60 degrees. We'll talk about these things called mid-latitude cyclones. You might have heard of them referred to as upper level lows. We'll talk about how they form and all of the various pieces of their their formation. So this is going to be a lecture today all about these things called air masses, which are big bodies of air characterized by their temperatures and humidities, the boundaries between those air masses, which are called fronts, and how those fronts all work together as part of one big low pressure system. In later lectures, we'll talk about some more of the specifics along those fronts, things like thunderstorms and tornadoes, and then we'll go on to talk about a different type of low pressure system, um, hurricanes and other tropical cyclones. Today, the ultimate goal is to get into these upper level lows or mid-latitude cyclones. So before we get into any of that, we first have to define what an air mass is. So an air mass is a large body of air characterized by similar conditions. So let's say over the entire interior of the United States. Right now, you probably have somewhat cool and dry air. Um, in a different season, of course, that would change a little bit. It would become more maybe hot and dry. Over the Gulf of Mexico, year-round, you typically have warmer conditions and you have moist conditions. You have a lot of moisture in the atmosphere, a lot of humidity. So all of these different regions, and these regions are really, really large. Think the entirety of the Gulf of Mexico or the interior of the United States or the North Atlantic Ocean. All of these are going to be um, the controlling factor in what kind of characteristics that air mass has. And those characteristics are gonna basically boil down into temperature and humidity. So as it turns out, these air masses are actually named for their source region. If you have an air mass that originates over the ocean, and it's a little juicier because of that, it has more moisture in the atmosphere, it's referred to as a maritime air mass. If it originates over the continent, it's called a continental air mass. If you have an air mass that's warmer, it's typically referred to as being a tropical air mass. If you have one that's a little cooler, we call it a polar air mass. And there's even another temperature um, letter that we're gonna use to designate these different air masses. And that's going to be one that doesn't actually influence here, us here in South Louisiana. Um, a uppercase A refers to an Arctic air mass, but that never really affects us all the way down here in, in um, Southern Louisiana. So let's just sort of distill it down for us here as being these four um, characteristics, these two temperature um, abbreviations and these two humidity uh, abbreviations. Basically, you can take any of these and combine them together and come up with the name of an air mass. The name of the air mass will always include the one that's indicating humidity, either the maritime or continental first, so an M or a C, and that'll be followed by the letter designating the temperature, tropical for um, a T and polar for a P, a P for polar, T for tropical. So take, for instance, if you're talking about a typical Gulf of Mexico air mass, it's going to be hot, it's going to be warm, and it's going to be humid. And so the way the meteorological vernacular for saying that is to say MT, Maritime Tropical Air Mass. If you're talking about a cold, dry air mass, essentially the opposite of something like the Gulf, Gulf of Mexico type of air mass, something that might originate over uh, Wyoming, for instance, it would be continental, it would be dry, and P for polar, so it would be a CP air mass. So here's a table illustrating all of the different air masses across North America, including that one that's not going to really affect us all the way down here, the A, the sort of extremely cold air mass. So you can have CA, there is no MA, so it's just going to be CA, and then CP, continental polar, MP, maritime polar, CT, continental tropical, it's a hot, dry, desert-like air mass, and MT, which is going to be your maritime tropical air mass, your sort of hot and humid air mass. 
this probably is going to be more important than really even understanding what all of those uh, letters are, are, are indicating. Um, this map of where all of these air masses are going to originate, where they're going to move across North America. You have all of your cold air masses obviously further away from the equator at higher latitudes, your MP air masses over the North Pacific and North Atlantic, and your CP air mass over the northern part of the United States and into Canada. The CA air mass isn't going to affect us. It's going to be closer up towards the North Pole. All of the air masses in red over by the bottom are the MT and CT air masses. <clears throat> Those are all in orange or red, and those are going to uh, it be the maritime tropical air masses over the southern Pacific and southern Atlantic, the Caribbean, and into the Gulf of Mexico, and then a seasonal air mass over the continental tropical area of the southwestern part of the United States and into the Mexican plateau. And so that essentially just sort of disappears over the winter. It becomes CP over the winter. So you can see how these uh, air masses are going to have a place where they originate, and that's where all of the bubbles are essentially on the map, is where they're originating, what they're named for, but they move around. An air mass that originates over the ocean can then move over to, onto the continent. Of course, that's going to mean a lot of rainfall. Take, for instance, as the MP air mass over the North Pacific moves over onto the continent, over places like Seattle and, um, um, and Portland, Oregon, so Washington and Oregon and Northern California. That's why you have such abundant rainfall there. You have a uh, moist air mass coming in onto the continent, dumping a lot of rain right there, and then it dries out before it can really sort of cross over the mountains and get into the interior part of the United States. So you get sort of a rain shadow effect. You get a lot of precipitation on the western side of the mountains in the Sierra Nevadas and in the Olympic Range. And over on the eastern side of all of that, you have dry, more like desert conditions. We have a balance in South Louisiana, particularly during the winter time, um, between the MT air mass coming out of the Gulf of Mexico, and that's going to dominate over the summer. It's going to draw back a little bit over the winter, and our winter weather is going to be defined by whether the MT air mass or the CP air mass from the northern part of the United States is going to play a bigger role in our weather. So particularly in South Louisiana, that's sort of why we have such chaotic weather over the winter months. We're on this battleground, particularly over the winter months, between these two very different types of air masses with different characteristics, warm and humid versus cold and dry. So um, here again are the, uh, the various air masses and their source regions, giving you an idea of why they're named uh, in such a way, and their various overall uh, characteristics. The CP air mass is cold and dry, originating in the interior of the United States. The MP air mass is cold and humid, originating over the North Oceans. The CT air mass is seasonal, originating in desert-type conditions around 30 degrees latitude, so places Places like the southwest of the United States and into Mexico. And then the MT air mass is going to be the lower latitude oceans over the South Pacific, South Atlantic, the Caribbean, and into the Gulf of Mexico. All right, so the air masses alone are very interesting, and you already get a little bit of a taste for how our weather is going to be determined by these air masses, because obviously we're going to get a lot more rainfall if the air mass is coming off of the Gulf of Mexico as opposed to up from the north, the, the CP air mass, which is quite dry. So already you can see how the air mass and the motion of these air masses is going to play a role in our weather. But it's particularly when you get a battleground between these different air masses that you have significant weather um, arise. And these battlegrounds are referred to as, as fronts, much like in militaristic terms, a front, a battlefront would be the line between two marching armies. The marching armies in this analogy, of course, are these air masses, and the front is the battleground between the two.
Now you have to remember that all these different air masses are going to have different temperatures and humidities, and temperature and humidity is what essentially equates to air pressure. So something like a CP air mass, a continental polar air mass, would have cold and dry conditions. It would be a little bit more sort of comfortable in a sense at the Earth's surface. It would be higher in density and higher in pressure. The MT air mass, in contrast, would be more warm, more humid, and both of those characteristics would mean a lower density and lower pressure on the surface of the Earth. So when you get a division on the surface between these two different types of air masses, you're going to have significant weather occur as a result. And that transition zone is referred to as being a front. And the fronts can occur because of any number of these different changes. A difference in temperature on one side of the front to another. A difference in humidity from one side of the front to another. So sometimes it's humidity alone and no significant change in temperature that's going to make the difference and allow for something going on with weather to be happening, something weird to be going on on either side of that front. A shift in the wind direction, because as we found out in the last class period, the reason why the wind blows is because it moves from high pressure to low pressure air. And if you have a shift in the wind direction, it's because you have a change in the characteristic of the air masses. You maybe have sharp pressure changes, which again are the combination of the change in temperature and humidity and clouds and precipitation. Whenever you have warm, humid air at the surface of the Earth, it's ultimately unstable and it always wants to move up into the upper atmosphere where that humidity cools and condenses and forms clouds and eventually precipitation. Sometimes you can, in a sense, sort of force that to occur when you have a boundary between different types of air mass particularly in one relevant frontal boundary called a cold front. So before we get specifically into cold fronts, I wanted to show you a typical weather map of the United States, and you can see almost all five of the um, all five of these individual types of fronts illustrated on the map. So the really important thing to remember, and then I'm going to focus on this a little bit later on in the same lecture, is that all of these different types of fronts are parts of a bigger overall system. And that big system on this map is where you have that L situated above the, uh, the Great Lakes. That L on the map is low pressure. And in this case, it's a specific type of center of low pressure called a mid-latitude cyclone or an upper level low. It's an upper level low to distinguish it from lower level lows, which are things like hurricanes and tropical cyclones, where the lowest pressure is at the Earth's surface. In these um, upper level lows or mid-latitude cyclones, the lowest pressure is often far up above the Earth's surface, and so you don't have the really chaotic and catastrophic winds that you'd associate with something like a hurricane as a result on the Earth's surface. So all of the different fronts, and we're going to go through them one by one, with the exception of one type of front, are all illustrated on this map. So the sequence in which we're going to look at these fronts is first to look at the stationary front. The front far off to the left in this picture where you have the alternating red circles and blue arrows is the symbol for a stationary front. In a stationary front, it does exactly what it says, that front stays still, and once it moves, once either the cold air or warm air starts to win in a sense, then it's no longer a stationary front. It's either a cold front or a warm front. In a stationary front, you do have a shift in wind directions, but they're parallel to the front and moving in opposite directions, as you can already see on the map, as the CP and MP air masses in this picture are moving in different directions. This is going to be almost sort of the point of origin for these things called mid-latitude cyclones, for reasons that I'll get into in just a little bit. The next type of front that we're going to talk about are the cold fronts and the warm fronts. The cold front symbol is a blue line with blue arrows pointed in the direction that the cold air is progressing. 
Cold air is ultimately always more stable on the Earth's surface. So it's less like a steep boundary between two different air masses and more like cold air tunneling in or sort of shoveling in underneath warm air. And as it does this, it's going to take the warm, humid air and push it up into the upper atmosphere. And that's why you typically have a lot of cloud formation, a lot of precipitation, a lot of like heavy weather events along cold fronts. So the symbol on the map, again, is this blue line with the blue arrows pointed in the direction that the cold air is progressing. You get essentially the same, but with a different color for a warm front. A warm front is where the warm air is winning, and it's moving through area that was previously dominated by cold air. So as the warm air pushes through, um, the line separating the distinction on the map is a red line with little red circles pointed in the direction that that warm air is moving. You do have some weather associated with warm fronts. You're always going to have some small amount of significant weather associated with any case where one type of air mass is pushing through and dominating an area that was previously dominated by another type of air mass. But it's far, far less than what you get along cold fronts. Finally, we have this thing called an occluded front. And to really understand occluded fronts, you have to really understand first the cold fronts and the warm fronts. When you form an occluded front, you actually have cold air on either side of the frontal boundary, for reasons that we'll get into in just a little bit. The symbol on the map is somewhat of a combination between the cold and the warm front, because the dominant thinking in how these systems progress is that the cold front and warm fronts sort of basically combine so that you have cold air on either side of the frontal boundary. And so the symbol is a purple line with the triangles representing cold front and the circles representing warm front. So it really is sort of like a perfect combination of the two um, uh, frontal symbols. The last one is not illustrated on here, and it's not really necessary for you to know that um, uh, this particular uh, front has a symbol. It's usually uh, an orange line on a map, and it's a type of front called a dry line, where you don't have a change in um, temperature on either side of the front, but you do have a change in humidity. So say, let's say the, the um, boundary between the CT and MT air masses, if you held temperature constant on either side, would be a frontal boundary called a dry line, because you'd have humid air of the same temperature on one side, and then same temperature on the other side, you'd have drier air. And the drier air would be marginally more dense than the humid air, and you would have some significant weather forming along a dry line. It's not necessary for you to know the individual symbol for that one. So now that we've seen all of these on the map and you see how they work in accordance with the overall center of low pressure, the mid-latitude cyclone, we're going to go on and talk about these individual fronts. First one, stationary fronts have no motion, thus they're, they're stationary. That's, that's pretty, uh, you know, pretty obvious probably in, in the name. In a stationary front, you do have a shift in wind directions because you do have two different types of air masses on either side of the front. Stationary fronts are not stable for long periods of time. They'll quickly transition into either cold fronts or warm fronts, depending on their individual location. So imagine if you have a stationary front as a line drawn on a map, and you have the cold air north of the stationary front moving off in one direction, and you have the warm air south of the stationary front moving in the opposite direction. The parallel but opposite wind directions are really important to getting these low pressure systems started. It's thought to culminate in the rotation that develops into these things called mid-latitude cyclones. So we'll talk about that a little bit more, but the stationary fronts you can basically think of as the point of initiation for these mid-latitude cyclones. This is sort of the initial stage of these mid-latitude cyclones. And they're sort of the mark of a, a juvenile system, in a sense. Next type of front that we're going to talk about, I'll spend a little bit more time with because it's very, very relevant. 
cold fronts are going to be, for us in South Louisiana, the source of most of our significant weather. Our weather in South Louisiana follows a very distinct pattern where, um, particularly over the winter, you might have a few days, maybe even up to a week, of some comparatively sort of warm, sticky weather. You know, you might have temperatures in the 60s and 70s and on a day in January, and then temperatures not really decreasing substantially overnight. You might have clouds cloud cover for a few days, maybe a little bit of precipitation, and then all of a sudden a really sharp line of thunderstorms comes in, sort of in a sense blows all of the rest of that stickiness out and replaces the weather around here with a few days of really crisp cold air and very dry conditions and there's not a cloud in the sky. And then that whole process starts over again. What you're seeing, in a sense, is the relationship between the development of all of these mid-latitude cyclones and where we are in South Louisiana, where we sort of end up on one side or the other of this entire frontal boundary. Now, the most significant part of this for us is when the cold front passes. When a cold front passes, you have cold, dry air behind the system, in a sense, sort of pushing that system along. And out in front of the cold front, you have all this warm, humid air that doesn't really want to be on the Earth's surface. It's less dense. It's very easy to make that stuff rise up in the upper atmosphere. It's essentially why you had all that cloud cover for a few days before the cold front came through and pushed it all out. You have all of this unstable air already. And so what the cold front does is it acts as a mechanism for a long line of thunderstorms to form and to continue to form. So a cold front pushing through is very, very obvious on a radar. Anybody that pays any kind of attention to weather can pick out a cold front, a really sharp line of thunderstorms on a radar map. But it's the fact that those thunderstorms are continuing to form because of a difference in pressure and temperature and humidity. That's the thing that's really relevant. A single line of thunderstorms isn't going to make its way all the way across the state of Louisiana, but the front that continues to make those thunderstorms form, that can progress across the state. So as the cold, dry air pushes through, it basically shovels through and pushes out all the warm, humid air and forces it up into the upper atmosphere. And you start to grow vertically these thunderstorms that have a very, very large charge differential. So one part of the cloud, let's say the lower part of the cloud, becomes more negatively charged. The upper part of the cloud becomes more positively charged. And air and moisture in the atmosphere and even something like a cloud is a terrible conductor of electricity. So instead of having a smooth um, distribution of electricity from one part of the cloud to the other, the way that the atmosphere remedies this is to form lightning and subsequently thunder. Lightning is nothing more than this quick discharge of the static electricity that builds up due to this charge differential in the cloud. And it's most notable when you have clouds with vertical development, and that's really classic along a cold front. So as we look at an individual picture of this, you can see how the warm, humid air pushes right up the frontal boundary, straight up into the upper atmosphere, and forms these tall vertical clouds. And these tall vertical clouds reach the upper part of the troposphere and very characteristically spread out on the top of the troposphere and almost look like the shape of an anvil. Now, I don't require everybody to know a whole lot of individual cloud names, but this one is particularly cool and it's a lot easier to remember than the dozens or so other cloud names. There are things like Cirrus and Cirrostratus and Cumulus and Altocumulus. These are all names of individual cloud types that all form at different altitudes. But these storm clouds have, I think, a really, really cool name. And you have to say it just like this you know, to, to make it sound cool and to indicate that these are storm clouds. I always say it like this. Cumulonimbus. The cumulonimbus. And you have to say it almost like you would say the word Voldemort. You know, you have to be thinking about this as, as like a really evil sounding cloud. Cumulonimbus clouds are clouds of vertical development where you have the charge differential and you have the static electricity building up and the lightning. And because you have these tall vertical clouds, you get a sudden downpour of rain and not this kind of drizzly rain over a few days. So you know when a cold front passes by, you have a nice line of thunderstorms. Imagine a day in January where you have 
you know, kind of sticky weather for a few days. Then you have this sharp line of thunderstorms that come through and wreak havoc. And they're gone in less than an hour. That cold front pushes through in an hour or two. And behind it, especially maybe the next day, you're left with really cold, dry air. Okay, so along these cold fronts, it's possible to even have these evil cumulonimbus clouds have a central rotation to them called a mesocyclone under certain conditions. And those conditions we'll talk about in the next lecture. If the clouds have this internal rotation, it's also possible for these cumulonimbus clouds to drop tornadoes. You can form tornadoes without a central rotation within the cloud itself, but those don't end up being the really dangerous F4 and F5 super twisters. The most dangerous tornadoes are tied back to some central rotation in the cloud itself. Okay, so the cold fronts definitely are going to be associated with the worst weather, but the entire spatial um, extent of these things on the surface is very, very small. So if you look on this particular picture, you have the entire extent of the cold front as it's going to influence the ground surface of only maybe 50 kilometers, possibly something like 30 miles on a map. So the entire cold front boundary might be the width of a parish in Louisiana, as opposed to the next type of boundary that we're going to talk about, these warm fronts, that can be essentially the entire width of the state of Louisiana. They are much, much wider, much broader features, and almost for that reason alone, are going to be associated with much less catastrophic and chaotic weather. So think a really sharp boundary with lots of chaos and lots of extreme weather with the cold fronts and a broader boundary for the, um, the warm fronts. A warm front, and essentially by definition, is basically just the opposite of a cold front. If a cold front is where cold air is pushing through, a warm front is the opposite. It's where warm air is pushing through and dominating an area previously dominated by cold air. This mechanically is a little bit more difficult to do because, again, warm air doesn't want to be on the surface. It already wants to move up into the upper atmosphere. And so that's part of the reason why you have a much broader boundary along these warm fronts than you do along the cold fronts. You also get cloud formation, but you get these horizontal clouds. You essentially don't grow these big, steep, vertical clouds along warm fronts. So you don't end up with really sudden, showery precipitation. You don't end up with thunderstorms and hail and tornadoes. And none of that kind of stuff is very typical of a warm front. Instead, you have very, very slow precipitation, possibly even snow, even though that doesn't sound like something that's going to be terribly uh, lost along a warm front. We'll talk about why you can get, under certain conditions, snow associated with these warm fronts. So this is our picture, our little mock-up and profile um, compared to the cold fronts of what these warm fronts look like. Warm, humid air is already unstable, and so you're going to have more cloud formation than you did back behind the cold front in the cold sector. You already are going to have some amount of cloud formation, some amount of, of stickiness in the air on the Earth's surface. Then as that warm air pushes through, it's pushing past an area dominated by cold air, but that cold air extends down to a really, really sharp V on the Earth's surface. So the entire duration of this um, warm front might be 10 times as wide, maybe 300 miles wide or 600 kilometers wide as compared to the much smaller um, feature that would be something like a, um, a cold front that's only, only maybe 30 miles wide. So the warm, humid air pushes up against the cold air. A lot of it rides up that boundary along a broader, more gradual boundary, moves up into the upper atmosphere and forms these horizontal clouds. These are nimbostratus clouds. It's not even necessary for you to even really remember that particular name, but they are clouds that are going to be sort of just drawn out horizontally as opposed to vertically. It means a lot less of the really sudden downpours on the Earth's surface and almost no chance of lightning and hail and thunder and, and um, tornadoes. The weird thing about these warm fronts is that if you live in the particular environment where you have temperatures on the ground surface that are going to be at or below 32 degrees, Celsius, uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, then at a warm front, 
because you're taking all this warm, humid air and pushing it up the boundary, but at the Earth's surface, you still have cold air, it's possible to actually get snow associated with a warm front. And it's more typical than snow that would be associated with a cold front. So you have to think about the boundary itself when you're thinking about the potential for these things to um, have the capacity to drop snow and not the name of the boundary where you're having this warm air replacing the, um, the cold air. So it's very common because these warm fronts are more conducive to forming snow for snow to be something that you have precipitation onto the Earth's surface and then the warm front passes. You have warm air replacing the cold air and that snow melts within a few days. It's certainly not impossible to have snow associated with the cold fronts. It just ends up being a little bit more common with these, these warm fronts because of having those cold temperatures at the ground surface. It's also important to maybe note at this point that in most places of the world, even South Louisiana, even in the height of the summer, it's always in a sense snowing. Most of the precipitation in South Louisiana, it's starting off up in the upper atmosphere a mile away from the ground surface where temperatures are lower and most of that precipitation is starting off as snow. It just melts on its way down and so we never actually see that unless the entire temperature profile all the way down to the ground surface stays below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. If it melts and refreezes, it's referred to as freezing rain or sleet. And if it melts before it reaches the ground surface, of course, that's just rain. So temperatures have to stay below 32 degrees Fahrenheit in order for that snow to make it all the way down to the ground surface as snow and not refrozen snow, which is a lot less exciting. So obviously that doesn't happen to us here very often. We have very, very little snow as a result in South Louisiana. Okay, so moving on into the next type of air mass. This one often occurs in the whole process of having these mid-latitude cyclones between the cold front and the warm front, and it's the differential in humidity instead of temperature. The temperature differentials are the cold fronts and the warm fronts. The humidity differential is going to be the dry line front. The dry line front just separates essentially CT from MT air mass. So no change in temperature, just a change in humidity. Dry line fronts, as we'll see in the next lecture, are important to the overall development of tornadoes. Along the dry line, this is typically where the rotation that will get uplifted to form the um, rotation within the thunderstorms, where this is going to originate. For us now, talking about the bigger context of the mid-latitude cyclones, we can just basically say these things are there and there's very little significant weather that you can actually see that's going to culminate from these dry lines. The last type of front, the fifth type of front, is essentially when the cold front meets up with the warm front. In the context of these mid-latitude cyclones, the cold front essentially just makes up one arm of this big low-pressure system, while the warm front makes up a separate arm. Ultimately, the cold front is always going to be moving faster than the warm front. It can, in a sense, catch up with the warm front. And when that happens, you essentially sort of zipper the warm, humid air out from these low pressure centers and cut off these low pressure centers from their source of energy. And so when that happens, when these things zipper together, when the cold front meets the warm front, this is called an occluded front. And to help kind of get this name down, it might be helpful to, to note that the definition of occluded is very, very similar to the definition of exclude, the, the opposite of include. If you include something, then you take it in. If you're excluding or occluding something, then you're removing it. And in this context, the occludedness is referring to cutting out the warm, humid air completely from that low pressure system by taking the cold front and pressing it up against the warm front. So you can see a series of pictures from the bottom up where the cold front meets up with the warm front and the warm air is stuck in between. And once that actually happens, once the initial point of occlusion happens and the cold front does actually catch up with the warm front, then all of that heat and humidity is just pushed up into the upper atmosphere where the temperature cools down, where the humidity is going to be forced to condense and to form precipitation, rains, and then that's essentially it.
This particular type of front very seldom reaches us because these mid-latitude cyclones, while they do reach these long arms across the United States that do affect us, so the cold fronts and the warm fronts do pass us, the point where the occlusion actually happens seldom reaches all the way down to South Louisiana. So this is going to be something that's going to be more typical of northern weather. So the big story here is not really the individual fronts, although it's necessary to understand those fronts to understand the mid-latitude cyclones. The big story here is the development of this entire mid-latitude cyclone and why it occurs and how it affects our weather and how it's different from tropical cyclones. So before I get even any further into that, I need to do a little bit of reviewing from the last lecture, and we need to get into the basic distinction between a cyclone and an anticyclone. This is essentially a battle between evil and good, the evil being the cyclones, the good being the anticyclones. It's essentially low pressure versus high pressure all over again. The latitude in which these things form is going to depend, is going to direct what kind of prevailing winds are going to steer these systems and how they develop in the first place. So mid-latitude cyclones are going to form between 30 and 60 degrees away from the equator in a part of the Earth's surface where wind directions are coming out of the west, the westerlies of the prevailing winds of the 30 to 60 degree latitude area. So because you have winds coming out of the west, the entire mid-latitude cyclone that develops in these middle latitudes is also going to be coming out of the west. And these cold fronts that are part of these systems are also going to be coming in sort of from the west. So really take a look at the winter weather next time you look at a weather forecast and think about how these cold fronts are always coming from a particular direction. They're always coming out of the northwest. They're swooping down across the state of Louisiana. If you have a more kind of chaotic, jumbled mass of thunderstorms, that always tends to be coming up out of the, the southeast. But the northwest is where you typically have a lot of these cold fronts coming from, and it's because the westerlies are steering these mid-latitude cyclones. Hurricanes and other tropical cyclones and low pressure systems that develop between 0 and 30 degrees are going to be pushed around by a different prevailing wind. These are going to be pushed around by the trade winds closer to the equator. So we lie right on 30 degrees north latitude. We're right on the barrier between these two, between having our weather be influenced by tropical lows versus upper level lows in the upper latitudes between 30 and 60 degrees north of the equator. It's also maybe necessary before we get into mid-latitude cyclones to do a little bit of talk about any kind of low pressure system and any kind of high pressure system. A low pressure system is essentially called a cyclone because of the nature of these things to have air that cycles in into the center of low pressure and then gets pulled up into the upper atmosphere. So a tornado could be a cyclone, a hurricane can be a cyclone, a mid-latitude cyclone, a, a, a huge upper level low that extends over most across the entire United States. That's a cyclonic system. The thing that they all have in common is that the pressure at the center of the system is low and air is going to spiral inwards into that center of low pressure because of the Coriolis force. The opposite of these are high pressure systems or anticyclones in which air spirals outwards. You don't really think about these as individual weather systems because they're just associated with nice weather. We get put most of the focus on the bad weather, the mid-latitude cyclones and hurricanes and tornadoes and so on. So with a low pressure system in the northern hemisphere, you have air moving into the center of low pressure and that air is going to be deflected off to the right. And so that's why we have the particular type of rotation for these low pressure systems that we do in the northern hemisphere. Whether it be a hurricane or another type of tropical cyclone or a mid-latitude cyclone, anything big enough to be affected by the Coriolis force in the northern hemisphere will have a counterclockwise rotation to it. 
That counterclockwise rotation is the effect of having the air being pulled into the center of low pressure, but deflected off to the right. And so no matter where you're coming from, your deflection is off to the right, and that's why you have the counterclockwise wind direction. If you were in the southern hemisphere and you were talking about a low pressure system, you would have the opposite direction of rotation. If you were south of the equator and you had a hurricane south of the equator between zero and 30 degrees south, then you would have essentially an identical system except it would be rotating clockwise as opposed to counterclockwise. It's one reason why hurricanes and other cyclonic systems never cross the equator. They are forming in such an environment in which they're controlled in part by the Coriolis force, and they could not be moved. There's no mechanism to move them across the equator, and even if there was, they would be shifted to rotate in the opposite direction. Okay, so a low pressure system in the northern hemisphere has counterclockwise winds. A low pressure system in the southern hemisphere has clockwise winds, clockwise cyclonic wind direction. The high pressure systems, because you have a divergence of air, air pushing outwards from a high pressure system, have the opposite sense, clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. So it really takes playing around with the pressure gradient force, the thing controlling the air moving inwards versus outwards, and how the Coriolis force is going to influence the circulation to get this uh, really down, which systems are going to move clockwise and counterclockwise, and how it's hemisphere dependent. The one thing that you always want to take away is that the pressure gradient force is essentially universal. Air always wants to move from high to low pressure, no matter where you are on the planet, but the deflection of that moving air is always going to be to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. So I've got a couple of side-by-side -side pictures of low pressure systems, one in the northern hemisphere and one in the southern hemisphere. The first one up here is a low pressure system, northern hemisphere, and you can see how all of this cloud formation is actually spiraling into the center of the system to the low on this map in a counterclockwise fashion. And so that's how you know it's in the northern hemisphere, because you have a counterclockwise wind direction. That's going to be every hurricane, every mid-latitude cyclone. As long as it's above the equator in the northern latitudes, it's going to have counterclockwise winds. The exact same system in the southern hemisphere would have the opposite direction of winds. It would have counter, uh, it would have clockwise moving winds, winds that are still oriented into that low pressure system, but spiraling in in a clockwise nature as opposed to a counterclockwise nature. So the mid-latitude cyclones are just going to be one particular type of cyclonic system or low pressure system that develops between 30 and 60 degrees north. So these are going to be the middle latitudes, which is how they get the name a mid-latitude cyclone. You can also have polar cyclones or polar vortexes, or as sometimes they're more kind of fantastically referred to on the news. These are low pressure systems that form north of 60 degrees. You can also have tropical cyclones that typically form in lower than 30 degrees, even though we know that they can move past that 30 degrees. So things like hurricanes can reach into higher latitudes, but you'll notice that they always initially form a lot closer to the equator. All of these different kind of cyclonic systems are going to be steered by the prevailing winds in the latitude belt that they're in, and the mid-latitude cyclones are going to be steered by the westerlies. So they're always going to form off to the west, and we name these prevailing winds for the direction that they're coming from. So the westerlies are going to push these systems from the west to the east and migrate them across the United States. They're going to affect our weather, and they essentially affect the weather of every single person living in the continental United States. Now, the point in which they initially form is at the horizontal boundary between cold air to the north and warm air to the south. And that's a kind of a shaky boundary because it's seasonally dependent. You're going to have cold air extending down further and closer to the equator during the winter months, and it's going to be tucked away a lot further up away from the equator during the summer months. But wherever that boundary is, where you have cold air to the north and warm air to the south, the stage is set for the development of these things called mid-latitude cyclones, and that's where we're going to start.
It's a great succession of pictures out of your book that show the overall progression of these systems, but almost always starts with what's called a stationary front. The stationary front is going to exist on the boundary between the cold air to the north and the warm air to the south. The cold air is going to be moving off in one direction and the warm air is moving off in the opposite direction. Because you have winds that are moving parallel to each other but in opposite directions, it's possible for a rotation to form between them because these winds are moving off in opposite directions. That rotation in the center will develop into the center of low pressure and intensify over time as warm air feeds into the low. Eventually you form a separate cold and warm front out of what was at one point the stationary front. So essentially the air masses start to move, the cold air progresses much faster than the warm air, and the rest of the game is all about the cold front catching up to the warm front, and as a result of all of that, the cold air catching up to the warm front is eventually going to create an occluded front, and it's going to kill off these mid-latitude cyclones. So if we look at these pictures piece by piece, we know that along the stationary front you have warm air moving in one direction, cold air moving in the opposite direction, and the rotation is going to start between them. And once the rotation starts, the pressure drops at the center of that rotation, and that's when you get the actual little center of low pressure. Then you also get the cold and the warm fronts. Along the cold and along the warm fronts, you have significant weather taking place because those fronts are all about one type of air mass overriding another type of air mass. As the cold fronts push down and push through, they're going to be associated with more significant weather, more you know, uh, thunderstorms and sudden downpour of rain and showers and, and lightning, thunder, hail, tornadoes, the whole bit. While the warm front, you have not quite as much of that significant activity taking place. So as the cold front pushes through, part of the reason why it has a more intense effect on the surface is because it's pushing through faster. The cold front is going to rapidly sort of catch up with the warm front. So the cold front is about to lap the warm front in a sense. The cold front continues to push through and that margin of air between the cold front and the warm front where warm humid air exists is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller over time. The really key thing to thinking about the development of these systems is that warm air between the cold and the warm front to, to the south of the low pressure system, that's like the power plug for these low pressure systems. A low pressure system is really just nothing more than an influx of warm humid air into the center dropping the pressure. So as long as there is space between the cold and the warm front, then the low pressure system is still in a sense plugged in. But that's not going to happen for long because the cold front is rapidly catching up to and will eventually overtake the warm front. It happens every time. So eventually the cold front catches up to the warm front at the point of initial occlusion and then the two fronts sort of just zipper together. And meanwhile, all the warm, humid air that was at the surface and was feeding into the center of low pressure is being forced into the upper atmosphere where the temperature drops and clouds develop. And all of a sudden, the low pressure system is kind of at a loss. It's no longer plugged into its source of energy. And so this is the point where the system really starts to weaken. The pressure is going to continue to rise as it's cut off from its warm, humid air. It's kind of like taking a hurricane and putting it over a continent and no longer has its energy connection of all that deep, warm water to keep it going and the system eventually dies. Same thing happens with these mid-latitude cyclones, but for a slightly different reason. They're cut off from their source of energy because the cold front has caught up to and taken over the warm front. So that's the initial occlusion and advanced occlusion. Eventually that low pressure system just becomes nothing. The low pressure system is going to continue to rise and all of that chaos associated with the rest of the cold front and the rest of the warm front and that occluded front, it just sort of loses its energy to keep going and the entire thing resets again to cold air to the north and warm air to the south.
it's really interesting to think about the entire what's called polar boundary or polar front where you have cold air to the north and warm air to the south as really being nothing more than a whole bunch of these mid-latitude cyclones sort of holding hands across that boundary. You can form multiple mid-latitude cyclones along that polar front boundary and that's actually exactly what really does happen. So extending from the western part of the United States all of the way over to the far eastern part of the continental United States, you might have one or two or three of these all in various stages of formation. And you can see how the fronts are going to connect the dots between those low pressure systems and maintain this barricade in a sense between the cold air to the north and warm air to the south. So in this picture of three separate low pressure systems, low number one and low number two, low number three, based on the way that we talked about these things forming, you can pick out the one that's newly formed, the one that's in its most advanced stage, and the one that's sort of in its, its middle stage. So if you wanted to think about them as a family of cyclones, you've got the baby cyclone. That's going to be low number one, and it's of course off to the far western part of the United States, because as these things form, they get migrated, they get pushed across the United States. <clears throat> The sort of middle-aged low pressure system is this low number two where you don't have the occluded front yet. You have the cold front well formed and starting to try to catch up with the warm front, but you don't have the occlusion yet. And so that low pressure system is still in a sense sort of plugged into its power source. Then finally, off in the upper right-hand corner of the picture here, you have low number three. And in low number three, you have a well-formed occluded front, that purple line, and then off to the far south, the separate cold front and warm front. So this is the more advanced front. This is kind of the geriatric. This is the grandpa front of the, uh, the three. And you know that because the occluded front has taken place. And that's cut off the low pressure system from its energy source. And so it's living on sort of borrowed time. So these low pressure systems form are created, they advance, they die, and they're replaced by other ones. And meanwhile, our entire weather, particularly over the winter months and for the rest of the United States, almost the entirety of their weather is going to be dominated by these processes. <clears throat> so that's essentially mid-latitude cyclones in a nutshell. Um, we'll continue talking about mid-latitude cyclones in the next class where we talk about the significant weather that forms along the cold fronts. So we'll talk about thunderstorms, different types of thunderstorms, these things called supercell thunderstorms that have the capacity to form tornadoes, and then we'll go on to talk more about tornadoes. After that, we'll get into hurricanes and then the fundamentals of, of climate and the global heat budget of our planet. So that's all we have time for today. Until next time, keep looking up.